Okay, uh, tell, tell me when you're ready to go. I think we'll just we'll, we'll take as little of your time as possible. We'll go right the way through, and then you know if it. Uh, work the work and the temptation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, Tommy, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Um, it would be really good, I think, to start if we could just set the scene for for students who, um, who probably don't don't see the senior management team very much. So if you could just talk very briefly about your background, that would be that would be very interesting. Have a personal background. Yeah. Okay. Well, gosh, uh, here I am. You may guess from my accent, I'm not exactly local. Not Hampshire born and bred. I'm from the northern tip of Scotland. I left school at 16 without any much qualifications to my name, and I served my apprenticeship at Atomic Energy Authority, Dunry, building fast reactors, which they're now busily dismantling. I became a student by accident in my sort of mid-twenties when I got a, a, a trade union scholarship uh, to the London School of Economics. I, became a, I was a young, aspiring union leader, shop steward. Went off to the LSE for a year, and like most of us, rather than go back to work, we rather like student life. And by total accident, I discovered student life in universities, and I've stayed studying and working them ever since. Right. And never left university since then, so I'm here by total chance. Can we talk about, um, I mean, these are difficult times for universities mm. with, with everything that's going on. And so could we talk a bit about um, the vision for the University of Winchester in the context of this new landscape for higher education? I mean, do you, do you see the university continuing to grow, or are we in a period of retrenchment? Well, uh, there, there's something in between retrenchment and uh, growth, I guess. Well, maybe not, but it's certainly more retrenchment for the next couple of years than growth. Uh, the government currently has a cap on uh, European, including UK, student numbers. Uh, we're all waiting with bated breath and considerable uncertainty about what's going to happen in 2012 when the new fee regime comes in. The government hasn't made its mind up yet how they're going to manage uh, numbers under that new regime. They are still making it up as they go along, I'm afraid. So mm -hmm. we're uh, basically presuming that we uh, won't grow much over the next couple of years, apart from in the international and non-EU recruitment. And we're basically assuming that if we get things right, uh, we will uh, be able to make the transition without too much dislocation to the university. It's not retrenchment, but it's certainly being sure that we don't take more risks than we have to in this period of uncertainty. I mean, some universities are, are reacting to the changing environment by scrapping courses. I was reading London Met's the most extreme example where it's scrapping 70% of its courses. Do you think that will happen in Winchester? Not 70%, but... It's the only example. People yeah. keep on saying, like, like as an example, it's not. London Met's right. a very particular example because they had very particular challenges there, shall we say. Uh, there is some trimming of courses going on, but not much. And we're not trimming, uh, not at all. Indeed, we've recently started some new programmes, uh, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. We're not looking to narrow the university. It's already small enough. Uh, we do about 25 different subjects. That's quite narrow for a university, and there's a danger of becoming too narrow. So no, we're not looking to retrench in that respect at all. Can we talk a little bit about tuition fees? Yeah. Um, and I mean, obvious, obviously, self-evidently, they've gone up. I think it would be of interest for people to understand the process that the university goes through. Is it, is it top down or is it bottom up? Oh, it's, it's top down as much as it's, uh, it's management uh, level discussions, then discussing with wider with their colleagues, and then discussing with their governors. The decision is one for governors to take, not not even the vice chancellor. Okay. We, we recommend, and the governors take the decision. Uh, we had a very uh, wide ranging discussion with the with the governors over a period of time, including, of course, the president of the student union, who is a governor. Mm -hmm. So the students are absolutely represented in those discussions. And indeed, Seb Mill, the the president of the student union, has been a uh, an important influence in terms of our approach to, to tuition fees. I'm not suggesting he agrees what we've done, but he certainly was a big factor in, in, in the discussions. Um, the sort of factors we take into account are, first of all, cost. You know, How much is it going to cost to provide for an undergraduate student in 2012 once the government takes away every single penny of state funding? Okay. So we need to make sure we have enough money to actually give the high quality experience that our students will quite rightly uh, do uh, demand now and will demand in the future. A second issue is competition, price. How do you do compared with the others? Uh, you don't want to be too far out of step with your competition one way or another. And it's not a case of cheap is good. Any prospective student looking at a range of universities and seeing tuition fees ranging, say, from 9,000 to 6,000, 
all the research would say that 6,000 might be quite too cheap, and cheap is nasty. So that comes into, uh, into the uh, equation as well. And it's, it's asking you to look into your crystal ball a little bit. Do you think, um, in terms of the number of applications you'll get next year, um, the increase in fees, would you, are you expecting fewer applications? We don't know yet is the answer, nor, nor does anybody, including the government. If they introduce the, this change at a, at a dramatic pace without having the foggiest idea what's going to happen, that's the honest uh, aspect of it. And there's two issues about demand, what will happen to demand for places. One is, will the total number of students in the country, will, will they, who want to be students, will they grow or stay the same or decrease? In other words, will the fee put enough people off going to university so the total number of students decrease? the cake, the size of the cake, how big will that cake be? Now, how big our slice of the cake is will depend on how good we are yeah. and how good our competitors are, yeah. and might depend, for example, on price, although I think n not much. So we worry about the size of the cake, and all the evidence from across the world is that it's pretty inelastic. You could put fees up by a large amount, as they're doing now, and it'll have very little effect on demand. That was certainly the case, say, five, six years ago now, when fees trebled from 1,000 to 3,000. Demand just kept on going up like that. We don't know whether that will continue with fees at eight, 9,000, but it looks likely. Our ability to have our share of the market is a critical point for us. Now, we've been hugely successful in recent years. Our share of the market has been going steadily up for five years now. Uh, we see no good reason why that would change, but we have to be very careful and have to be mindful of the new market that we're uh, entering into. The last thing I would say about that is that it's all about the student experience. Uh, will students come here and feel that £8,500 and what they get is value for money? If they do, we'll succeed. If they don't, we won't. And that's why, for example, we're not retranching in terms of cutting back on, on expenditure or not building new buildings. We're actually investing in the future because we know students coming here will demand a high quality experience. Something that intrigues me is as, as fees go up, will the relationship between, not, again, not University of Winchester, universities in general, and students change? Will students become consumers? Yes, will they become customers? Well, they've been predicting this for about 10 years at least too. Uh, when fees first came in, about £1,000, students would become more like consumers. They got up to £3,000, students would become more like consumers. They have become slightly more like consumers uh, in the past 10 years or so, but not nearly as much a change as I had predicted. I thought they would be much more demanding as consumers should be, who are paying at the moment £3,700. That's a lot of money. Mm. Uh, and uh, that does change the relationship between the students and the university. Now, the complexity, of course, is that students are indeed consumers in as much as you buy a service from the university. Now, that could be a service for education, but it could be car parking, yeah? or catering, mm -hmm. or accommodation. You're paying, what, £4,500 a, a year for accommodation. That's a pretty serious consumer, that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they are consumers, there's no doubt about that at all. But in education, of course, they're also partners in, in the learning experience. And that's a very unusual business to run, where your consumers are also your partners. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, a consumer uh, doesn't like what they want, they walk away, don't they? You go next door for a can of beans. Well, it's not so easy to walk away in the middle of your second year if you're not happy, is it? So you're not free in the way that consumers are. On the other hand, we set rules for our consumers. We say, we will fail you. Mm -hmm. No, we will stop providing you with that education because you're not good enough. Yeah? That's a very unusual relationship and that won't change. Students will not become only consumers. They might become slightly more like consumers. And if, if the University of Winchester was a business, what, how big a business is it? Is it, is it a yeah. £10 million business? Or? The University of Winchester is a business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, my colleague, the Director of Finance and Strategy, people might, like myself, our main day to day, you, you, you asked about the day to day work, and I gave you an example of one day, it's basically running a business. We turn over about 47, 48 million pounds. Right. We have about 750 established staff and another 500, 400, 500 casual staff, including student uh, casual employees. So that's the size of the business. The impact on the local economy is around about 170 million pounds a year. Uh, we're a big business yeah. in a small city like Winchester. Absolutely. And a bit also, by the way, a big, very big supplier of, uh, of high quality, low cost labour in the labour market. Of course. Oh, yeah. Winchester relies upon students to run many of his businesses. Yeah, it does. Um, you mentioned at the start that your background was in 
the union movement. Mm -hmm. um, as a union man, I mean, job losses <laughs> must be, a former union man, job losses must be a, a bitter pill to swallow, mustn't they? There's nothing so annoying to trade unions as, as an ex-trade unionist who's all of a sudden on the, on the management side. And, and I, 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 did, I didn't say poacher and gamekeeper at all. Absolutely <laughs> right. I, I did this very room this morning. I had a, one of my regular meetings with the trade union representatives on campus to discuss where we are with, with, with cutting the, the, the staffing bill. Um, I have no split personality in this at all. I'm employed by the University of Winchester to help manage this university. Other people are here to represent the interests of the staff with respect to trade unions. That doesn't mean I don't have a responsibility for staff, of course I do, but I'm not the representative. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely uh, here to, to represent the interests of the employer when it comes to industrial relations discussions and stuff like that. However, what I would say is that we've thought long and hard and had many discussions with the trade union representatives and, and speaking to all the staff as well about how we try and cut the costs we've had to cut this year. You know, you've you've, we've talked a lot about 2012 right, and beyond that. You know, we've had to cut a million and a half, roughly, of expenditure off that £47 million in this year uh, in terms of uh, the 2011-12 budget coming up. We can't do that without losing jobs. It looks like through voluntary severance and through freezing of posts, we will probably make the savings we require without having to move to any kind of culture, compulsory redundancy. We can't guarantee that. We're getting the budget finalised at the moment. We won't know. But our ambition is to make these cuts without having any compulsory job losses. If we achieve that, then we will be, I think, uh, content, and I hope that our staff will be content that we've handled it in as humane way as, as possible. Okay. Like any large organisation, um, the university is a rumour mill, like every other. Sure. So let me try a couple. More of, than most. Let me try a couple of rumours on. Go on. I mean, the, the one that's going around currently is that the University of Southampton would like to have a presence in Winchester beyond uh -huh. beyond the Art College. Yeah. And so will Winchester be subsumed into that, Southampton? Th th that's one rumour that's got some truth in it. Uh, the uh, University of Southampton have indicated that in, in their four-year plan they are considering uh, increasing the presence in Winchester. Currently, as you say, they, they own and run the School of Art, uh, and they have intimated that they may look to expand their provision in Winchester. That's absolutely true. And would that mean taking over the university? Oh, goodness, no, 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 not at all. There's nothing to do with that whatsoever. The, as I say, the, the Winchester's got two universities at the moment. The mm -hmm. University of Winchester, which is the University yep. of Winchester, and we've got you know, one small part of the Faculty of Arts of the University of Southampton, called the School of Art, which is here. Uh, all the University of Southampton are speaking about is, is increasing that uh, presence, maybe into some other subject areas. Okay. And of course, which subject areas would be of interest to us, shall we say? Okay. Uh, but most cities in the UK have got two universities, yeah, not at all uncommon. You go to even Canterbury, a similar place to this, the University of Kent, Christchurch, Canterbury. Uh, Southampton itself has got, the, so uh, has got the two universities in it. And world goes on with two universities in one city. Having said that, this is a small city. Uh, we're a small university. Uh, and we have absolutely the ambition that we are Winchester's university. And then we come in along, panking, uh, parking their tanks in our lawn, and that'll give us uh, cause for concern, shall we say. And we are indeed uh, considering a response to that at this moment. A final question for mm -hmm. you. Um, it's the one I think everyone finishes with. If you had your magic wand and you could <laughs> change one thing, what's the thing that you would do um, with the University of Winchester? Me. Um, I would do two things. I would, first of all, transfer responsibility from car parking from me to somebody else. <laughs> and I would make sure that this university never ever loses or changes its core values. If we keep our values, we'll succeed in this brave new world. And don't forget what we are and how and why we've been successful since 1840. And that's basically about values. So I wouldn't want to change it. I want to make sure it doesn't change. Okay. Tommy, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>